On today's program, you'll meet a woman who was abducted by a serial killer, wanted by the FBI for raping and murdering 40 women. A man who raped and murdered 30 women was arrested by an invisible force. Next on this edition of It's Supernatural. What if you went shopping, Kmart, you're coming back to your car, and all of a sudden there is a gun in your ribs and a man that is on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, a man that has brutally killed 40 women that looked like you, said, get in the car. What would you do? On December 11th, 1981, a woman was praying and she felt an impression to go to a Kmart department store. And she drove to the store, got out of her car, and Margie Palm, what happened? Well, I was walking to my car and when I got to the car, I felt something in my back and I thought, what is that? And I turned around and there was this man standing there. He was shaking and crying and he had dressed in black. He had a gun about that big, not a small handgun, a mm. big 38 caliber revolver. And he had it stuck in me. And then when I turned around, he stuck it right here. And he said, I am the man who killed the girl last night at, um, it was at a bar in, um, in, in San Antonio, Texas, where I live. And he said, and I have um, cut a man's heart out in prison. And if you don't do exactly what I tell you to do, I'm gonna kill you. And I, I knew he was serious. I'd never seen anybody remotely like this man except on TV. And so, um, and the other thing was I hadn't read the paper. So I didn't know that this man had done this, but it was headlines of our papers newspapers and uh, friends of mine told me there were helicopters cir circling San Antonio looking for this man. So, I mean, what he said was bad enough, but yeah. had you known that this yeah, was a I man that, that murdered and raped yeah. 30 women? So the guns in your ribs, what's the first thing you thought? Yeah, well, the first thing I thought was, I'm gonna die today. That was the first thought that came into my mind. And uh, I could feel this terror trying to come on me. My, I could feel my body starting to shake and then out of my mouth, it was very interesting, out of my mouth came the words, do you know Jesus Christ? <laughs> You're saying that with the gun in your ribs, do you know Jesus Christ? What did he say? He, he said, no, I don't want to know Jesus Christ, lady. He said, get in the car and sit on your hands until I decide what we're going to do. So I got in the car, I sat in the passenger side of the car, and he told me to sit on my hands, which mm -hmm. I did. And... Um, he stuck his gun right here in my ribs and he told me if you try to escape uh, I will shoot this gun and kill you so and I knew he was serious I'd never seen anybody like this man so I began to ask the Lord within myself what am I doing here why am I here I mean I love you Lord why am I here and I heard him say that he had put me there and anyway I started to pray and I, I was like this in my car and I was praying and all of a sudden I saw a like a picture inside of myself and um, I, I also saw scriptures from the Bible like mm -hmm. there they were in front of me and one of the scriptures said I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy nothing shall by any means hurt you and then I heard the Holy Spirit tell me, take your hands out from under you, put them on his head and take authority over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will by any means hurt you. I had been a believer in Jesus for many years. And of course, you know, this man's telling me he's gonna kill me and I'm seeing what God, this, I felt that this was what God was telling me, was the scripture. And then I saw the scripture that said, um, I, I, I have these signs shall follow them that believe they shall cast out demons. So then 
I saw a picture of myself take my hands out from under myself and put them on his head and command these uh, demonic spirits to come out of him. And you know, I thought to myself, if this isn't God, I'm dead. And I decided that it was the Lord. I mean, I had, the Lord had been training me for many years to hear his voice and I knew it was him. Uh, so I decided to do it. I said, okay, inside of myself, okay, Lord, I'll do it. I took my hands out from under myself after saying to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Stephen. He was so filled with hatred and fear and, and he was just, you could see it all over him. So, uh, did you I, pray for him? And I believed the Bible. You but know, did believed, you pray for him? I did. That was the next thing I did. So I took my, I said, uh, I didn't look at him. I said, I'm going to pray for you. And he said, lady, you're not going to pray for me. And I said, yes, I am. I took my hands out from under myself. I put them on his head and I said, in the name of Jesus, I use the authority of the name of Jesus and I command every demonic spirit to come out of you. Of out of this man, I command it to leave my car. I command the spirit of death to leave my car. And I am telling you today that this man will be serving Jesus before today is over. And I mean, I was screaming this in the car. I sat back down and I sat, put my hands back under myself and I kind of went like this. And the next thing he said was, oh my gosh, I'm in a car with a religious freak. <laughs> <laughs> he really was. <laughs> and uh, he said, are you conning me? And uh, I said, what do you, I've never even heard anybody say that to me. And I said, no, this is real. I'm really like this. And that morning I had put my Bible in my car and um, this book of scripture that I'd been compiling. And so I said, look, you think that's normal for a girl to carry a Bible and a book of scripture and evangelistic tapes I had in my car? I said, you think that's normal? And he said, no, I don't think it's normal. <laughs> I said, this is real. I mean, I said, you, God put you. All of a sudden I was realizing that God had put him in my car. And the other thing I was realizing was that um, the fear and terror that was in the car had left. After I prayed, all of a sudden this peace came in the car. Well, the next thing that happened was he said to me, uh, I don't know why, but I don't feel like raping you. I feel more love coming out of you than anybody I've ever known in my life. I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't understand. Are you an angel or who are you? <laughs> and I don't understand why you're not afraid of me. And I said, well, you know, Jesus is not gonna appear to you unless it's a phenomena, but he appears through his people and you are being confronted with Jesus Christ today with his love because all day he was telling me that he had he had he said I have so much hatred in me if if there is a god there's no way he can get it out of me and I was said well I would say well there's no the only reason I'm in this car is because god put me in the car with you and uh so when I wasn't afraid of him he started thinking I was an angel but that was be the reason I didn't have fear is because God's power was in the car. I mean, it, you know, he said there's a scripture that says there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And he was feeling that. Now, what did you feel towards him? Uh, that was the other amazing thing was, uh, it, you know, at first I felt that fear. But after I prayed that prayer, this peace came into my car and I, I felt this overwhelming compassion toward him that I, I don't know that I've ever felt that much compassion for anybody that is, hates me and is trying to kill me, but I, I felt this overwhelming love and mercy and compassion for him. Um, I guess the, the forgiveness of God came into me. I felt, I felt it. I mean, I felt God's, uh, the feelings of the Holy Spirit. I felt uh, this incredible compassion for him and it transmitted to him. I mean, he could feel that. And um, as I said, at one point he said, I feel more love from you than anyone I've ever felt. I've been around in my whole life and I don't understand it, lady. Why, why didn't he just let you out of the car then? I mean, well, he, he over and love. over all day long, he told me he was not going to be able to let me go, even though why? he liked me. Um, because he's, he said that he was afraid I would tell people about him and that he would be found. And 
I would not let myself think about who he might be. You know, mm -hmm. I just kept my focus on the Lord, and I prayed a lot in the Spirit. When you prayed uh, in I the prayed spirit. in tongues. I that, that's a language that God gives mm -hmm. you that you pray not from the intellect, but mm -hmm. from the spirit. Like uh, Paul in the New Covenant said, yeah. I pray in tongues yeah. more than any man. And I think in a situation of extreme terror, which there was, mm -hmm. I was being, uh, have been placed in a situation like that, your mind almost shuts off in your spirit. What's really inside of you? What's the guts of who you are is going to come out. The out spirit the man is going to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mm -hmm. mouth the speaks. The mouth speak. And uh, that morning, the Holy Spirit had had me praying five hours. And uh, I know he had been preparing me, you know, spiritually. So I was built up spiritually. Also, uh, previous to that, he had had me, I'd go off in my car and I would just uh, memorize whole passages of scripture and I had a an unbelievable hunger to just feed on the word and put the word inside of me I kept hearing the uh, uh, God seemed to be telling me over and over my mercy endures forever and I felt I, I kept thinking to myself this is God's love this is how God loves people and a man and as separated from God as this man could feel that love was able to penetrate it. Yeah, it was penetrating him because even after a while, I mean, you know, he, he was saying horrible words, cussing up a storm, really. But every time he'd say a cuss word, he would say, I, I'm so sorry, lady, <laughs> I'm saying that. I am so sorry. I know that's offending you. He was starting to become convicted every time he'd say a word, a, a, a word that might be offensive to me, which was very interesting. Um, then we started talking and, uh, you know, he said, I'm never going back to prison again. And I said, well, you're in a prison right now. You're in a prison of hate. Um, he kept telling me, uh, that the police were going to surround us somewhere along this, uh, adventure that we were on. This so there'd be encounter. a shootout and you'd get in the crossfire if nothing else. Yeah. And I didn't know there were helicopters circling San Antonio at the time. There were police going up and down the streets. Uh, he'd been on the FBI's 10 most women list for over 10 years. Ooh. And uh, so anyway, he's, I told him, I said, There's, there are evangelists that go into prisons. He said, well, like who? And I mentioned the name of an evangelist, and he just seemed to latch onto that name. Kenneth Copeland, who I named. And uh, he said, well, where does this man live? And I said, well, he lives in Fort Worth. And he said, well, I want to go up and see him. And I said, well, I don't know this man personally. So he said, but I want, to, I, I want us to go up there. He was talking about maybe going uh, up to Austin, up, then, then up to Fort Worth or going straight to Fort Worth. And while he was talking, um, I saw a road blockade. The Lord gave me a picture inside of a road blockade around Austin. And uh, then he showed me a picture of a small little bus station in Kerrville, and I saw Stephen getting on a bus. So I told him, um, I said, the Lord has shown me this picture, and I said, we're not supposed to go to Austin. There's going to be a road blockade. And uh, I said, we're supposed to go to Kerrville. Well, you had a, uh, a, a vision had a showing vision. you there was this road block. He must have thought you were nuts, but did. how did he think... That well, you were telling him the truth. Well, after I told him this, uh, he said, I want you to go into that uh, convenience store there and get me a paper, cigarettes, and beer. And um, so I said, well, I'll do that, but I, don't make me read what you've done. I don't want to know mm -hmm. what you've done. I mean, I was beginning to get the idea he, he had done some bad things, but never dreamed that really, really horrible. <laughs> So I went into the 7-Eleven and nobody was in there except me and it would have been very easy for me to escape. But again, um, the Lord told me that I had, he, he told me stay in this thing, keep, stay with me. And there's a, a scripture in Romans. Margie, oh, no, it's stay crazy. in this thing. Yeah. We'll be right back after this. Marga, you went in the 7-Eleven, there's a mass murderer in the car with a gun, killed 40 women, looks just like you, though you didn't know it, but you knew there was something going on. Why didn't you go through the back door of the 7-Eleven and leave? Because I wasn't thinking like a human being. I was thinking <laughs> like the Holy Spirit. 
but uh, he kept giving me Romans 6, 16, whomever you yield to, you'll be a servant to. And I knew that if you yield to the spirit of fear, if I yielded to the spirit of fear, something terrible could happen. And I just made a choice. And with God, everything is a choice. You have to choose to obey him and choose to serve him. And I chose to do that. I went back to the car and when he opened the paper up, he looked at me after reading the first little section mm -hmm. in the paper and he said, this first section says there's a road blockade in Austin. How did you know that? You had that, war, that yeah, vision? Yeah, and I had, had a vision about that. And I said, well, God told me that. Wow. And he said, well, now, what else did he tell you? And I said, he told me that we're supposed to go to Kerrville and you're supposed to get on a bus up there. He said, well, let's, okay, lady, let's do that. So we proceeded up the road to Kerrville and I happened to have two tapes by the evangelist I mentioned in my car. Uh, so we listened to that for a few minutes and then he turned it off. He said, I need to tell you, I have this son that I, I really love him, but I, I can't stand to think of him uh, in this world. I, you know, it's such a horrible world and I've had such a horrible life. And, well, anyway, I said to him, uh, okay, you've been talking about your son. I wanna ask you a question. If your son had committed the same kind of crimes you've committed, and I don't know what they are, but if he'd done exactly what you have done, number one, I wanna ask you, would you forgive him? And number two, if there is a hell, would you be willing to go to hell for him? Would you be willing to die and go to hell? And uh, I want to know if, if, if you could still love your son if, if he'd done those kind of crimes. That's a very... Would uh, you forgive him? That's a very penetrating question. So it was, he said, well, that's a hard question, lady. And I said, well, you need to answer it. I want you to answer me. And he said, well, you know what? You're saying to a man, yeah. a psychopath with a gun, yeah. that you need to answer it. Yes. Lady, you got chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, he said, you know what? I would die for my son. I would die for him. And uh, I would forgive him. And I said, well, you know what? That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. And he just looked at me. He said, um, he said, I, you've been preaching to me all day. And I finally understand what you're trying to say. And then we just kind of drove on in silence for a while. And all of a sudden he pulled my car over to the side of the road and um, he was looking all around my car. He looked in back of him and all over the place. And um, I didn't know what he was doing. What he, was he looking for? Well, he stopped my car on the side of the road after looking all over the place. And then his hands went up in the air like this and he said, Jesus, I'm sorry for everything I've ever done. Please forgive me. I want to go to heaven. And I just sat there staring him at him because I had not said to do that. But what had happened was he told me later, he said, uh, remember when I was looking around the car? And I said, yes. He said, I heard an audible voice. And he said, it came from up here and it said to me, this is the last time I'm going to call you, Stephen. Mm. And so... He said, when I heard that voice, and I, now I didn't hear it, but he heard it. And he said, it was very loud. He said, I knew it was Jesus. And he said, I knew all day, everything that had gone on, how, you know, I, I, he said, I could just see a, the peace that you'd had and everything. And I realized that this was not a joke. You had this, everything you'd said was true. And there really was a Jesus and is a Jesus. And this was not a something you made up. He said, I had thought it was just, a, you know, you had this strong faith, but I knew it was something real. So look, he's one so. of the 10 most wanted men in America. There's helicopters going all over. Everyone's looking for him. They're furious to find him. What did he do next now that he believes in Jesus? Well, I mean, uh, at that point in the car, you know, when he put his hands up after hearing this voice, he started crying and, uh, he said, it's gone, it's gone. And I said, what's gone? And he said, lady, something just came in me and all the hatred is gone out of me. And I'm, I'm so horrible, I don't deserve this. And uh, I mean, he was just sobbing and sobbing. He said, lady, would you mind if I just gave you a hug? I can't believe this, I can't, this is really real. And I said, I know, Jesus is real. Hmm. He said, I've been hating and hating and I've hated myself and hated everybody else. And I'm, I feel like I've been clean, I'm, I'm clean now. And I said, well, you have, 
what the Bible says, you have been born again. And he said, what in the world is that? And I said, well, when you got born the first time, you have an earthly mother and father and you have their, their blood in you. you. You are their seed. Well, when you ask Jesus to come into your life, he puts his seed into you, which is eternal life. And he becomes, God becomes your father and Jesus' blood comes into you. You have supernatural DNA and he washes your sins away supernaturally. When did, and, he, um, when did he decide to give himself up as opposed to have a shootout? Yeah, well, we kept driving on to Kerrville, and at one point he stopped again, and uh, he asked me to open my purse, and he emptied all the bullets of his gun into my purse. And uh, then we went into Kerrville, and I thought, if they're in a bus station with a bus going to Austin, <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> so when we uh, pulled into Kerrville... So the human um, side started Yeah, the to human out side came out, bit. too. So I would... We found the bus station. It was very small, just like I saw in that uh, vision. So I bought one ticket for him. And I walked out, you know, holding it like that. He was laughing. And I opened the door, and he said, don't tell me. It's going to Austin. And I said, yeah, that's where it's going. So I got in the car again with him. And by that time, I mean, we sat and had a hamburger at a hamburger place. And this I began, is wild. It was, it's wild. It's the wildest tale. And... Um, I began to tell him about this, the, the reality of the spiritual world, and I said, um, you know, the Bible says the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and uh, I am a lot weaker in the flesh than you, but God has had me using the weapons of his word, he's had me using the weapons of prayer, and look at the, look at the change, look what's been happening. And he said, you're right. And he said, you know what, lady, I've, I've never noticed all day what you look like at all. And right then the bus uh, pulled up. And uh, I said, well, your bus is here. It's time for you to get on that bus. And here I was telling him to get on the bus. So, uh, I mean, he... You said your goodbyes? Yeah. He we got said, on the bus? Yeah. And, and he and said, if I don't happened? see you again, I'll see you in heaven. So they in eventually caught him and um, he was executed. But uh, there is a big prison ministry now as a result of his life. He, um, what did he say had, to the police officer that arrested well, him? Well, um, he said, if I had seen you earlier this morning, there would have been a shootout and I would have killed myself. But I met this lady today and she changed my life and I'll never be the same again. So, Looking back in retrospect, how could you have done that, Margie? I couldn't how have done How could it. you have gone through this? I couldn't have done it without Jesus. I mean, you're just, you're just a mom. I know. I am. <laughs> well, I mean, I couldn't do it without Jesus. But that morning, I said, I will never forget this. That morning, I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do for you. Don't ever say that if you don't mean it. Because yes, God literally you, used me. Had you not, had I not done I'd be that, dead. you'd be dead. I'd be dead. Did you hear that? Ooh, you know, you know something, so, uh, Margie? You know, you know something? When he got on that bus, he gave himself up without any fight. He went to the electric chair. He was executed. But he went knowing his sins were forgiven and left a little fruit along the way, the warden came to make Jesus his Messiah. Do you remember what God told Margie? God told her to tell him, this is your last chance. I gave this book to him and I said, I want you to take this. And when you get on that bus, I said, I want you to say the scripture out of your mouth, not to yourself. You said, out of your mouth so Satan can hear you. Because he will come and tell you that nothing happened to you. And I want you to assure him that you are a new creature in Christ. Because he will not obey anything unless it's the Spirit of God. He won't obey your little puny word. But he will obey the authority of the word of God in the name of Jesus. He knows he was defeated. But he wants to see if you know it. <laughs> So he, he didn't want to leave. He, was, he said, I don't want to leave. I've never met anyone like you in my life. And I know that, that God did put us together. And um, I said to him, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get home. But I can tell you, I cannot lie for you. 
And from what I understand, he has never let any girl go. Um, but he said, I could never, you know, I'm just a different person now. And he got in the bus waving to me, smiling. <laughs> and, uh, of course, people asked me, why didn't you call the police right then? But, you know, I could have called the police at any time that whole day. And there were many chances and opportunities I had to tip people off or make a phone call to the police. But when you're walking with the Spirit of God, you obey Him. Because if you don't, you might end up dead. I could have ended up dead trying anything. Because my your reason will say, we'll call the police. But the Lord can see the end before the beginning and he knows exactly he will order your steps he says he will make the crooked places straight and go before you and fight for you so uh, I just put my hand in his hand and trusted him totally I drove up before the bus and of course as I told you I didn't know that he was a big celebrity in the criminal world at all I thought I was going to get home and say to my husband, you're not going to believe what happened to me today. <laughs> well, he had seen the 10 o'clock news, and of course, Stephen Moran was the first story on, and they said, we believe that he has remained true to his pattern. He's probably picked up a woman on the north side, and well, my husband started to panic. And uh, our next door neighbor is his partner, so he went over there and said, do you think I'm just crazy to believe my wife, Margie, could be with this guy? And... Uh, they said, no, we don't. You better call the police. The partner's wife said, wait a minute. She was going to buy you this hunting rifle in Austin. Maybe she went up there, you know, as a Christmas present. Maybe she went up there to get it and had a flat tire on the way home. And his partner said, well, I hate to tell you this, but she's already gotten it. Well, they all, you know, just sank. <laughs> well, he called the police, and when I got home, my house was just surrounded by police. And, of course, he was standing out in the front of the house, and he was very fearful. But when he saw me drive up and I was smiling, his fear turned to mad. He was just furious. He said, look at her. There's nothing wrong with her. She hadn't been with that guy. She's just fine. He was just furious. <laughs> I waved to him when I drove up. He yanked that car door open. Where have you been? And I said, you see all these bullets? Do you see the headlines of this paper? I've been with this guy all day long. And he, he started, his knees buckled, and his partner picked him up. He said, I was in better shape than he was and all the police. <laughs> the police, really, they were just buzzing around my car, getting fingerprints, and they just couldn't believe it. And I kept saying you all don't understand, this man has given his life to Christ. And they said, get her a martini right now. She's all shaken up. <laughs> and next thing I knew, I was down at the police headquarters telling the story to the sergeant there. And as I started to tell him the story, he said, now just wait a minute. And he went out to my husband and said, I'm a Christian, but is your wife prone to fabricate? I mean, does she make tales up? This is the wildest tale I have ever heard. <laughs> he said, I would believe it if I were you. Well, I told him the majority of the story, but I could not tell him the part about Stephen being in Austin. He was in Austin waiting for the bus to go to Fort Worth. You know, I did not want to betray this person, and uh, I had... You know, a lot of things going on in, inside of me at the time. I thought, I just, I don't want this person, I don't want to destroy Christ for them. If they find out I've just knifed them in the back immediately, you know, is he going to still stand on the Word of God? You know, the parable of the sower, where the sower sows the Word, and it says Satan comes immediately to steal the Word of God. And so I wanted to the best of my ability to be obedient to the Spirit and intercede for him so he would be strong and be able to stand against that attack. I went home, and when I got home, it was like a buzzer went off inside, and I said, I've got to tell you, I know where he is. I can tell you now where he is. He's in Austin waiting for the bus to go to Fort Worth. He's been there three hours. And my husband, you know, why didn't you tell me this? What's the matter with you? <laughs> and I said, I just couldn't tell it. I could not tell it until now. And he went over to the phone, called the FBI, and said my wife knows where he is he's in the bus station in 
Austin waiting for the bus to go to Fort Worth. And, of course, the FBI agent said, you know, she's crazy to believe that a man that's been eluding us for 10 years is going to be sitting in the Austin bus station for three hours reading her book of scripture. He said, there's just no way. That man probably got off the bus in Kerrville and is long gone. He said, you know, people don't get on the 10 most wanted list by being stupid. And uh, he said, there's a very slim and none chance this guy's going to be sitting there doing what she thinks he's doing. And he said, well, you know, you just take or leave the information. Uh, about a half hour later, that same sergeant called back, and he said, I just want to tell you what has happened. He said, I decided I ought to call the Austin police. And he said, they surrounded the bus station there, and they were expecting a shootout. And when they walked in and they... They saw him sitting there, and he was reading this little black book. <laughs> and uh, he, Stephen stood up, and he said, the sergeant said he gave us all of his weapons. He said he also had two knives in his boots, and he had another pocket full of bullets, which he could have reloaded his gun, and he did not. And he said he gave us all of his weapons and told us that, he said, if I had seen you police uh, sooner today, there would have been a shootout and I would have killed myself. But today I met this lady and she changed my life. The sergeant says on the phone, well, all I can tell you is, uh, well, God bless you. <laughs> Anyway, I mean, it, there have been so many things happening since then, it would take me, you know, another hour to tell you, but I'm not going to. But I am going to say, like I said before, you know, God has no hands but our hands in this earth. What um, touched my heart and hurt me was the fact that this man had been walking around for 31 years and never heard about Jesus Christ, you know, and there are thousands of people walking around just like him. He was married at one time, and his, I found this out later, that he, after he left his wife, she became a Christian. She went to a Billy Graham crusade, gave her life to Christ, and a few days before I met Stephen, she saw him on TV, saw something on the news about him, and she had a friend, and she said, we've got to pray that Stephen comes to the Lord Jesus and they both prayed in her house. And that prayer really started the ball rolling because uh, that man had never been in Texas before, Stephen. And, of course, here he is in San Antonio. <laughs> I'm sitting in the car with him. But there is a scripture that says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong in behalf of those people whose hearts are perfect toward him. And... He wants a vessel that wants to be used. Many people are walking around that have the knowledge of the Word, but they don't. Jesus is not Lord over their life. You know, He wants He wants to be Lord of every aspect of your life. Otherwise, he's, your will to make Him Lord is what opens up the door for Him to come in and use you. He wants a person that's willing to be obedient. Secondly, the power of love is what won that man. Not criticism, not telling them they're doing the wrong thing. They already know that. You know, an alcoholic knows that. But it's the love of God that cuts through those barriers and wins people to the Lord. God bless you all. Mike, uh, we probably ought to tell what happened after Margie and Stephen separated there, after he released her. Mm. Uh, he was waiting to catch a bus in Austin. I think she implied that at the end. And uh, the police uh, caught up with him there in the bus station uh, on a tip from Margie. They found him sitting there reading a book of scripture. And uh, he surrendered peacefully. He gave up his weapons, a thirty eight caliber pistol and knives in his boots. I got a phone call from this person that said, Hello, I'm your sister in Christ. And she said that she had had a prison ministry and she'd been spending a lot of time with Stephen and asked me if I would please come in and see him. And I said, I just can't unless God really does something drastic and tells me to do something. So I began to communicate with her and she was communicating to him. 
and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and I felt like God was telling me to go into the prison and uh, I knew it was the Lord but I didn't want to do it I'd never been to a prison and it had been you know weeks since I'd gone through this and uh, I was going to meet this woman who I'd never met and I met her down there and she said listen nobody can get in to see him of course I having never been in a prison I didn't know you needed uh, lawyers letters and things like that to get back to see somebody like that and uh, they brought him out in shackles I mean, his feet were bound and his hands were bound. He was behind the glass, and this policeman told me to go back there. And I said, me? And he said, yes. I said, well, I, you know, I can't. And he said, yes, you can. Go on. So he, he uh, allowed me to go back there, and when I did... Stephen started crying, and I said, why are you crying? He said, last night, I told God, tomorrow is my birthday, and the only thing I want for my birthday is to see that lady and to know that this is something true. I mean, you know, it's not something I made up. And he said, and here you are. I started crying. I thought, this really was God. You know, he, of course, he said, don't feel bad about turning me in. He said, I'm, I'm not mad at all. I have a lot of peace, and... We had a, a long talk, and um, I saw him the day before we, uh, he was executed, and before he died, the warden came up to me, and he said, Stephen brought me to Christ. He said, I realize now that I didn't even know the real Jesus Christ, and I'm really sorry that he's going to die because he's helped a lot of us back here, and the warden started crying. and. He said, this man really has helped a lot of us, and he goes into the chapel and prays a lot. But the day I saw Stephen before he died, he said, I'm going to tell you something that I never told you. It happened that day. And he said, remember when I pulled the car over and, you know, I put my hands up in the air and I said, yes. You know what happened? And I said, what? He said, I heard an audible voice. And the voice said to me, this is the last time I'm going to call you. When I heard that voice, I knew that everything you'd said all day was true. I knew there was a Jesus, and it scared me so much that I stopped the car and put my hands up in the air. He said, I never told that to anybody because they thought I was so crazy anyway. I heard a voice, Margie, and it was a powerful voice. Let's uh, tell the people a little more about who Stephen Morin uh, really was. Uh, he was 34 years old at the time of this encounter with Margie. Uh, he had originally uh, grown up in Providence, Rhode Island. He was called a drifter um, by the press. Uh, it, Margie says that uh, he had lived a horrible, horrible life. His mother had stuck him in a detention home when he was eight years old, and uh, from there he was in different detention homes and was constantly in and out of prison. The FBI had identified him as a, a cocaine addict, a drug dealer. I mean, this was a bad character. Officials in uh, Corpus Christie, Texas, said that he was wanted in at least uh, nine states on 30 different cases, virtually every one of them involving uh, one or more counts of capital murder or attempted murder or rape. And Margie was literally in the hands of a killer. And yet she kept her confidence, kept her cool, and the Lord used that in his life. Uh, he then stood uh, trial, uh, was convicted while he was in prison. He continued to walk with the Lord. Stephen was later executed by lethal injection in the penitentiary at Huntsville, Texas, and yet uh, apparently he died with a testimony on his lips. That's the best evidence we have. He was executed, Mike, for the murder that he committed at 2 a.m. the morning before he abducted mm. Margie. I had the joy of ministering in different prisons around the world. And the most joyous experience of my life, a young man by the name of Stephen Moran, he was a serial, serial killer. He killed 21 women. <laughs> and he made the, quote, mistake of kidnapping one of my partners. He, and he, was, he just grabbed her, but she was in the parking lot. He just grabbed her to get her car. And he was, he was escaping from a trap that the police had set for him, and he got out. And, uh, and he, he, he said, now, you just, you just sit there and shut up or I'll kill you. She said, you ain't gonna kill me. 
You're not going to kill the only person that loves you. Woman, you are crazy. And she just wouldn't quit. Just telling him she loved him and God loved him. He said, woman, he stopped the car. He, he finally got out of the city of, of, of San Antonio. And, and he just finally just slammed on the brakes and told her to shut up. She said, well, may I listen to my tape? He said, I don't care what you listen to. Just shut your mouth. <laughs> now, I don't know whether it's Mark 11, 22 or not, but <laughs> it was faith. And they're driving along there. He's, he's getting away, you know. And finally he slammed on the brakes and he said, who said that? And he looked in the back seat. She said, what are you talking about, Stephen? He said, I heard a voice. Who said that? She said, what did the voice say? And he dropped his head over on the steering wheel. And he said, the voice said, Stephen, this is your last chance, son. She said, Stephen, that was Jesus. And right there in that car, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I baptized him in the county jail, the Barrett County Jail in San Antonio, Texas. He was executed by lethal injection. Hang on a second. I carry this with me everywhere I go. March 13th, 1985. And I had ministered to him off and on different things. It's quite a story. I wish I had time to tell you all of it, but uh, he had, um, he turned down all of his appeals and everything. He said, I, I, I don't have any family anymore and they're, they're, they're all gone. And he said, I just want to go to heaven. And so I was the last one to visit with him. And uh, we had about 30 minutes together. And I witnessed his execution. And um, the warden at those days, Warden Lawrence Harvey was a good friend of mine. And uh, we had become acquainted in all of that, all of that powerful outreach in the Texas prisons and, and so forth. Oh, Jesus. And just moments, it was time for him to go. And I, I, I said, Steve, uh, do me a favor. Give me a, a sign if grace is enough. Yeah, he said, I'll do it. Now, don't get the idea that lethal injection is an easy way to go. No. It's just more positive than the old electric chair and a whole lot more humane than that gas chamber. But nonetheless, when they throw the switch on that thing, it makes a loud clanging noise. You know it's coming. Now, he was strapped to a gurney and I'm as close as from you to me and there's a little railing there and the other witnesses were there. Warden Harvey said, uh, Stephen, you have any last words? And, and uh, oh yes, sir. And he started preaching on the Holy Spirit. And finally, Lawrence Har and Warden Harvey said to uh, Steve, I, you know, I apologize for interrupting here, son, but we've got business to take care of. You see, yes, sir, I know it. And he said, Heavenly Father, I give thanks for this time, for the time that we've been together, the fellowship in your word, the Christian family presented to me, and he called the names of personal witnesses. 
Allow your Holy Spirit to flow as I know your love has been showered upon me. Forgive them for they know not what they do as I know you have forgiven me. There were people in that room who were glad to see him die. They wanted, they'd kill him themselves if they could. Lord Jesus, I commit my soul to you. I praise you and I thank you. They threw the switch and that thing made that bang in noise. And here it came and, and he strapped that gurney and he's this close. And he looked over there at me and went <laughs> two thumbs up more than enough. And just seconds later, his body lunged one time and he's present with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a marvelous, wonderful thing? It's so amazing to me what this book will do, what the name of Jesus will do. Glory to God. Well, I don't understand that Copeland. Somebody killed that many women. No, Stephen didn't kill those women. Well, no, no, he is innocent of every one of those murders. Stephen Moran died and became a new creature. The new Stephen Moran had never killed anybody. That's not who he was. That's who he used to be. Right there is where you say amen. amen. <coughs> oh, come on. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And that's happening in prisons all over the world. I, um, I told him, uh, I said, Stephen, you've got an opportunity to now, even though there's no appeals or anything, you're still going to be in prison for, you know, for a couple of years here. Anyway, you have time to become an expert on prayer. I said, you study prayer. He said, I will. And my and brilliant man, he started studying prayer and he, he, he wrote on prayer and nobody, nobody came on death row that Stephen Moran didn't get you born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was kind of boss of death row. I mean, he had a, well, we won't go into his record. <laughs> you know, amen. Uh, this man, he walked with me as far as he could go. And he had a great big coffee table Bible. You know, one of those great big white ones that nobody ever reads. <laughs> That's the only Bible he had. And somebody, somebody had given it to him until some of us got him a Bible he could carry around. This thing is huge. And he's walking with me to the, to the gate as far as he could go, you know. And, and, oh, he said, Brother Copeland, oh man, I'd love to go with you. He said, I'd, I, I just, I, I'd, I'd love to go, go with you and preach. But he said, I want to tell you something, brother. He said, I'm freer in here than I ever was on the street. He had over 125 years to do. The last I heard from him, he's out preaching the gospel. <laughs> Glory. Come on. 